believe that if we treat them like idiots, they'll grow up like idiots. But if you train them up like soldiers and arrows in a hand of a mighty warrior, you're going to raise up something powerful. And to see, man, I would venture to say definitely over three quarters of this room raised their hand that received the Holy Ghost at the age of nine or younger. I received the Holy Ghost when I was nine years old. Nine years old. I'm 37 now, and I haven't really grown in size since then. And the, I'll never forget that day, I was at church, and I was asleep the entire time. It was one of my favorite services. Now, growing up, like, the, you know, the three easiest places to fall asleep was at a desk in a classroom, behind a steering wheel while driving, and church. The three easiest places for me to fall asleep. And, uh... But I was, I was there, nine years old, and I fell asleep the entire church service. And then someone woke me up. That was the cue that service was over, and it was time to go run in the parking lot in the hood of Southside Chicago. We, we had church in the hood. We had, uh, we had people, uh, this one lady got shot in the church from outside in the parking lot, blood squirting all over. It was, it was pretty cool. And, um, I mean, every, every, uh, virtually every Sunday, our cars got broken into. Altars were always filled. People were like, oh, God, please, not my car tonight, not my car tonight. But you never want to remove what keeps you praying. So, so we, 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 we had church in the hood. It was pretty awesome. And so I would sleep the entire service, and someone woke me up, so that means it's time to go play. But when I woke up, like, the altar call was still going on. And I look at my friend, I was like, what are you doing? Why would you wake me up? He's like, look, your, your little brother He's praying, and he's about to get the Holy Ghost. You woke me up for that. And so I'm staring and watching my little, my little brother, you know, uh, uh, praying, and all these people around him. And I'm like, what a little jerk. He just wants attention. And as he's praying to receive the Holy Ghost, you know the moment he gets the Holy Ghost. And of course, the only way for someone to get the Holy Ghost, it's like a 1 to 20 ratio. There has to be one person that needs the Holy Ghost and 20 people that basically are like vultures around that one person that are going to give them the Holy Ghost. That's the only way someone can get the Holy Ghost, right? Everyone's got to shake them. Everyone's got to spit on them. Everyone's got to share their germs. Everyone's got to push them around. And all that's, that's the only way it can happen because God needs our help to do that. And so I'm watching it, and you know the moment they get the Holy Ghost because all the vultures, it's like they all break out. You know, they all flock away, and they're all dancing around. And so my brother gets the Holy Ghost bomb. And uh, I remember sitting there watching. I was nine years old, and I was ticked off. I was mad. Because growing up, there was something we had called sibling rivalry. You know what that is? You know, yeah, a little bit. Uh, two brothers, an older brother, a younger brother, and an eldest sister. And uh, we had lots of rivalry and competitions. You know, we would, we would compete over everything. Who's the strongest? Who was the fastest? We never had a competition for who was the smartest. It was a three-way tie. We was, we was dumb together. But I knew since he got the Holy Ghost, like he was going to rub my nose in it. I knew, I, I, I began to, just, this, is, this is a true story, I'm not making one thing up. I've been known to exaggerate, but I'm not exaggerating about this. And so, I'm sitting there, and I begin to play out what's going to happen in the next few moments. When church is over, our mom and dad are going to take us outside, and we're going to go into our pink Astro minivan. That's how we rolled. I don't know why my father bought a pink minivan. But we had a pink minivan, because, I don't know. But we were going to get in our pink minivan. And my little brother was going to go, I got the Holy Ghost, you didn't. I got the Holy Ghost, you didn't. And I predetermined in my mind the moment he says that, I'm going to throat punch him as hard as I can. 
We got some sadistic campers. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to change direction here in just a moment. Preach love, mercy, grace, forgiveness. <clears throat> But I was gonna, I was gonna hit him as hard as I could, and then I was gonna open the sliding door of the minivan, jump out, run away from home, and live on the train tracks for the rest of my life. I had it all figured out at the age of nine. So I'm sitting there in my imagination, premeditating this, and I am steeping with anger. I had a huge anger problem at a very young age, and it went into my teenage, young adult years. And so as I'm, I'm. I'm basically steeping over this. All of a sudden, I, I just start thinking, man, I, I want the Holy Ghost. And if he could get the Holy Ghost, I know how evil he is. If he can get it, I can get it. And then I begin to cry, and I begin to repent, and I begin to ask God for forgiveness for wanting to punch my little brother. And I began to cry out to God, and God filled me with the Holy Ghost at the age of nine. And my little brother was seven. And when we got into our pink minivan, we said, Happy Mother's Day. It was an awesome moment that my little brother and I got to celebrate with our family and our mother on Mother's Day. And God gave us the gift of the Holy Ghost. I shared a little bit with you, I, I haven't always served the Lord. I backslid from my sixth grade year to my senior year. And I pursued the things of this world, and I was pretty adamant against the church. And I, was, I, I caused a lot of problems, and that's a whole other story for a whole other day. But I, I intentionally fought against the church. I caused lots of significant problems. But I'll, I'll, I remember when I was 18 years old, it was just... About one, two months before I graduated, my pastor was preaching a service, and I was sitting there, and he preached a sermon with such conviction, and, and as he began to talk about the consequence of sin and talk about hell itself, I can feel the heat of the pit of hell. I can feel the flames reaching out for my feet. I, I can feel the intensity of and conviction got a hold of me. And I ran to that altar, and every ounce of fluid that can come out of my eyes and nose was dispensed upon the altar that day. And God forgave me, and God restored me into the church. It was a very powerful, very real moment. But when I prayed through, I had a number of struggles in my mind, and I had a lot of things I was putting the weights in the balance as I was wanting to count the cost of the decision I was beginning to make. Because I determined, look, I only got one shot at this thing called life. I don't know how long I'm going to live, but however long I live, I don't want to be a part of something that is fake. I don't want to be a part of something that is just a family tradition. And I don't want to give my life to something that is a cult. These are all things going through my mind at 18 years old. I, and I said, you know what? That experience was very powerful, but I, I want to get this for myself. I, I want personal revelation. I want personal understanding. And I begin to go through the core doctrines of our apostolic faith, and I begin to take those and just kind of finally comb through the Word of God and try to figure out whether or not what I am a part of is real or not. And one by one, I begin to see things as true, as true, as true. And one of the hurdles I had was about the doctrine of the Holy Ghost. Everyone say the Holy Ghost. I, I, I struggled with this idea a little bit about the speaking in tongues that is this, is, is, was my experience when I was nine years old, I am thankful for my experience at such a young age. But when you are filled with the Holy Ghost at such a young age, when you get older, you can become cynical. You can get, become jaded. And you can look back to that experience and begin to question that experience. Was that real? 
Was that genuine or was I brainwashed? Was I just mimicking my surroundings? Was I just given to an emotional euphoria at that pre peer pressured moment? God's going to help us here in just a few moments, all right? I had these real struggles going through my mind receiving the Holy Ghost at a young age. There's a lot of opinions about the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of teachings about the Holy Ghost, especially when we talk about speaking in tongues. Some people say it doesn't exist. Speaking in tongues isn't real. Well, I, I, I've seen too much to know that's, that's just not true. It's just not true. But I've heard people as I would sit and have discussions about the Holy Ghost with various friends and acquaintances trying to figure things out. People say, well, it's of the devil. That speaking in tongues is demonic. And it just takes a little research in the scripture in the opening of the birthday of the church in the book of Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost is first poured out that you find out when they begin to speak in other tongues, it says they magnified and spoke of the wonderful works of God. Ain't no devil praising God. Ain't no devil talking about how great God is. So I'm like, well, that can't be true. But then there is the camp of theology that begins to try to discredit this whole speaking in tongues phenomenon, saying, you know, it's just gibberish. It's just this emotional jargon that you get worked up and you just spit stuff out. Again, in the opening of the church in Acts chapter 2, we know that not to be true because the Bible says there were Cretes, there were Arabians, there were people from Phryg uh, Phrygia and, and, and all around parts that heard them speak their own language and they understood it. So that discredits the idea that this Holy Ghost outpouring is just gibberish. That it's just some sort of emotional makeup that you throw out there and then you feel better about yourself. And so I got that checked off. And I'm like, okay, this, this, this is not of the devil. And, and this is not gibberish. But the one thing I, I found myself struggling with was the other camp of theology. The teaching, the doctrine that speaking in tongues is real. That it does happen today. But it's just one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. And not everybody experiences speaking in tongues. Anyone ever heard that before? A couple people? Well, if you haven't heard it, you will hear it one day if you are engaging people with conversation trying to help them have a conversion experience. And that was a struggle because I would sit there and talk with people that would justify saying, look, I have the Spirit of God, but I don't speak with tongues. I'm full of God's Spirit, but I don't speak with tongues. And they would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and they would read from verses 9 on through to verse 10 and verse 11, and they would talk about these nine gifts of the Spirit. And they say, see, Mark, you, you, can, you can have the gift of you can have the Holy Ghost and not have the gift of prophecy. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's right. See, you can have the gift of the Holy Ghost, but not have the gifts of healing. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. See, you can have the Spirit and not have the working of miracles. Yeah, I, I see that. You can have the, the gift of the Holy Ghost, but not have the gift of wisdom. Well, I know that. You can have the Holy Ghost and not have a word of knowledge. You can have the Holy Ghost and not have, you know, uh, uh, the interpretation of tongues. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's right. See, you can have the Holy Ghost and you don't have to speak with tongues. And I'm like, I see what you're saying. But all of a sudden it dawned on me. That if I use that line of logic, I have to use that line of thinking and logic for all nine gifts of the Spirit. So I turn the question to this. So are you saying I can have the Spirit and not have faith? Because isn't faith one of the nine gifts of the Spirit? Because I thought in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace through 
are you saved? How can I have the Spirit and not have faith? If it takes faith to be saved. You know, Hebrews eleven six that without faith, it is impossible to please him. I cannot please God without faith. But how are you telling me I can have the spirit but not have faith? Or is it talking about a different kind of faith? Just like it's talking about a different kind of tongue. For it says in 1 Corinthians 12 that there are diverse kinds of tongues. But there's only one baptism of the Spirit that all must be baptized with. Paul goes further on to explain in 1 Corinthians, this is just Bible study, we okay? We okay going through the Bible for a moment? 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 2, Paul goes on to explain this. He says, look, there is a speaking of tongues that is unto God. Then in verse 5, he says, there is a speaking of tongues that edifies self. Then he says, there is another tongue in verse 6 that is to edify the church. There is a speaking in tongues that is upward. There is a speaking in tongues that is inward. And there is a speaking in tongues with the purpose of going outward. There is diverse kinds of tongues. But see, there's only one baptism of the Spirit. And the baptism of the Spirit is the same for every single person. Anytime and every time someone is baptized with the Holy Ghost, these signs follow them that believe. It's important we have a revelation of where we stand, as we talked about yesterday, because there will be confrontation. There will be a battle. I don't think I said this yesterday, but it was seven years before I saw one person get the Holy Ghost in the church plant and when I would preach a sermon. Seven years. You better know what you believe, because you don't always see the results of what we read in this book instantaneously. And every time I pray for someone to get the Holy Ghost and they would not receive the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, I would go back to the drawing board and I would look at the book and I said, that's what it says. So I go back to the next service and I preach the Holy Ghost and nothing would happen. But I go back to the book that is forever settled in heaven and I said, that's what the book says. So I go back to the next service, the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year, the sixth year, the seventh year. It was a real struggle, but you've got to know you got a sure foundation. And after year seven, we have seen over 100 people filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. This year, every single month, we have seen people baptized and filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You got to know what you believe about the Holy Ghost. I remember even after those things that I found in the scripture, I still struggle a little bit with this idea, well, you know, the Bible's a book that's going to defend itself, obviously, and I remember being at a, a church camp, and there was this, this nine-year-old boy, my heart goes out to him, he's got hurler's disease, if you saw him, you would recognize instantly something is different, something is off, and, and uh, his, his growth is stunted, and and uh, he's just a sweet boy. And he would, year after year, he would pray to receive the Holy Ghost. I'm like, man, this sweet little kid, what, what sins does he have to ask God to forgive him? There's, he's, what's the worst thing he's done? Like misplaced his Bible trading cards? And uh, so I, my heart went out to him. And I, and I remember the year that he got the Holy Ghost. He came to the front. He received the Holy Ghost. And he began to jump up and down. And... One of his friends his age came by him to rejoice with them, and they freaked out, and they ran to their mom and dad. And 
they grabbed the mother. The mother came and she heard the boy worshiping God. And she was just amazed. And she ran and got her husband. And all three of them were just blown out of their mind. This was a family that was out of Haiti. And they practiced witchcraft. And they, they were around this nine-year-old boy. And they could hear him speaking in their native tongue, Creole. And he began to declare, the enemy is under my feet. The enemy is under my feet. I say all that to say this. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You are not a part of a cult. You are not a part of some sort of brainwash movement of just high peak emotionalism that peer pressures people into speak a few syllables. What you are a part of is powerful. And what you are a part of is the real thing. Samoto. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You've got to get it settled, therefore, in your heart what you believe. And I believe tonight God is going to confirm His word with signs following to this group of people here today. There's many reasons why God chose speaking in tongues. One, you can read James chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that in many things we offend all. And if any man offend not in word, he's able to bridle the whole body. And it speaks about all the wild beasts, the animals of this earth that we have tamed and have been tamed. But the tongue can no man tame. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And the tongue is a steering wheel of your life. It sets the course, the direction. It's set on fire of hell. And basically, if you think of yourself as an automobile, and you think your tongue as a steering wheel, which is going the wrong direction, you're on a highway to hell, when you surrender to Jesus completely and fully and you let him, you, you lift your hands and you say, Jesus, take the wheel. And you let him take the wheel and he'll give you a U-turn. He'll give you an about face and he'll send you on the right course, on the right direction, on a highway of holiness, on the way to heaven. Paul goes on to explain in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in verse 21 and 22. When he speaks in verse 21, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 28 verses 10, 11, and 12. For with stammering lips, you know what stammering lips is? You know, when you're cold. Well, you guys ain't, you don't get cold in Mississippi. And when you're in South Dakota and it's negative 40 degrees, your mouth does this. That's stammering lips. The Bible says with stammering lips... That means God's presence is in the proximity. But another tongue is when God is within and his spirit begins to speak through you. It says, well, I speak to this people. And this is the rest where he causes the weary to rest. This is the refreshing. But Paul uses that in 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22. And he says, look, I'm letting you know that is the sign. And he says, wherefore tongues are for a sign. Not to them that believe, but for them that believe not. Someone who is not a believer, who is yet to experience the new birth experience of speaking in tongues. He says, tongues signals to them when they have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. God is so gracious, so merciful to say, I want you to know that you know that you know when you receive the Holy Ghost, I will signal it to you. And from the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak that Jesus is at the helm. Jesus is at the steering wheel. Now, I, my mind works sometimes. But it does work a little differently. And I, 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 at 11 times out of 10, I'm the dumbest man in the room. I, I'm not highly intellectual. I really do struggle with things. And so I, you know, I pray this prayer when I would try to read the Bible. I didn't understand it. But the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 18, Open thou my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I have prayed that God would take scales off of my eyes so I can see the treasures that are in the field of the Scripture. And you could pray that. You could be the biggest idiot in this room. But you can ask God to give you the ability to understand his word. This is a true story. I have a friend, believe it or not. And this friend of mine, his, his grandfather was illiterate. 
And he wanted to read the Bible. So he prayed and he asked God to gift him the ability to read the Bible. And God healed him. But he could only read the Bible and nothing else. There's no excuses. For if you are really hungry to get the treasure that's in the field, you can get it. And so, when I look in the scripture, one way God helps me to understand is I got to fully immerse myself in the story. I got to put on the flip-flops. I got to dig my finger toes into the sand. I, I got to try to relate to the characters that are in the story. And some characters are easier to relate to than others. Like, I can, I can empathize with Peter. Some people like to mock him for, like, you know, you know, foot and mouth syndrome or mock him for sinking in the water because, you know, his faith kind of began to sink. Like me, I'm like, man, Peter's got more faith than I would have got on the boat. I, put a, I probably would have sunk the boat, you know, wet in my pants. I'm like, I, 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 this guy's got more faith than I do. And there's other people in the Bible, I don't have an ever-loving clue what it's like to be, I don't know what it would be like to be Zacchaeus. Am I moving too fast for you? I'm sorry. Great humor in the room. And so that's what I do. I, I immerse myself in the story, and I try to become one of the characters in the Bible. And one day, it dawned on me that there were two characters I never thought what it would be like to be. I never thought, what would it be like to be an angel? And what would it be like to be a demon? What goes through an angel's mind? What goes through a demon's mind? I've been talking for about 15, 20 minutes and just going to go about 40 minutes more. With this concept in this question or this thought. Angels and demons, curiosity. What goes through an angel's mind? What goes through a demon's mind? God, I pray you help us these next few moments. I need you, Jesus, for without you I can do nothing. It is not by my might, it is not by my power, it is by your spirit. And I pray, God, that you would arrest the attention of every person in this room because I believe you are going to confirm your word with signs following. Lord, we're trying to lay the groundwork of scripture so there is a foundation that we can build upon. And I pray, God, that your spirit would launch forth in the next few moments. Someone say in Jesus' name. Angels and demons, curiosity. What would it be like to be an angel? Some of you girls are like, I already know. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what would it be like to be an angel? Perfect. Sinless. In the presence of... It, is there a chair? I saw like a chair over there. Can, you, can someone grab me a chair? Brother Axe Man. Your brother Phil's the one that throws the axes, right? Yeah. His last name's Hickman, but it's supposed to be Axe Man. It's not funny either. Nobody, nobody laughs in Mississippi. What would it be like to be an angel? You know what angels get to do they're in heaven around the throne of God they do now what we hope to do one day and that is to be in heaven in the throne room of God around the very presence of God they, I, I don't know about you but I want to go to heaven I want to see Jesus the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2. Immediately I was in the spirit. And behold a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on that throne. There is one that sits on the throne. It is the king of kings. It is the Lord of lords. And he has a name written on his thigh. It's Jesus. The king of kings. And the Lord of lords. When we get to heaven. It's not going to be a game of musical chairs. That people take turns getting worship. When we get to heaven. We will see Jesus. And we will worship. These angels in heaven worshiping the one who sits on the throne. And the Bible says 
that they sing a song. I, I love singing songs. I remember I had a, a, a pretty big beef with 7-Eleven songs, you know, seven words sung 11 times over and over and over again. On and on and on and on it goes. When this song stops, no one really knows. Your love never fails. I would get aggravated sometimes. You can sing that song if you want. It's okay. Like, my wife and I, were a little different when it comes to music. When I find a song I like, I play the mess out of it all day on repeat one. <laughs> I, I, I wear it out as fast as I can. And it doesn't ever get old. Like, it just keeps, like, feeding in the fuel of the joy of that song that I'm listening to. And I used to not like the 7-Eleven songs until I read the Bible and I found out there is a song in heaven that doesn't have a lot of words. And it just goes like this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I can see Gabriel and Angel, you know, the first time they sung that song, they're like, man, that's so good. Let's put that on repeat eternity because you cannot ever over expound holiness for holiness is not weakness. Holiness is who our God is. Holiness to the Lord. We praise Him in the beauty of holiness the angels don't get tired singing holy god forbid the church get tired of talking about holy 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 what goes through an angel's mind it's curiosity what would ever distract him from the most awesome thing to be a part of and that is to be in the very presence of God we hope to be here one day we hope to cast our crowns at this throne one day we hope to be here the angels are here what would ever distract an angel from the holy things I take our attention to 1 Peter 1 12 unto whom it was revealed not unto themselves but to us did they minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel. Someone say the gospel. The gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost. There is no gospel without the Holy Ghost, by the way. The gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things the angels desire to look into. An angel that gets to be in the very presence of God and say, holy Holy, holy. The only thing that goes through their mind are holy things, sacred things, awesome things. Holy, cinnamon toast crunch, coffee, things that are of God. What would ever distract an angel from this? Holy, holy, holy ghost. What is going on down there? See, the angels get to be around God, but you and I get to be filled with the presence of God. An angel who has never sinned gets to be in God's proximity, but you who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, God says, I'll put a throne in your heart and I'll sit there and I will live with you. I will... You got an opportunity that no perfect sacred angel has. Someone shout the Holy Ghost. Come on, someone shout the Holy Ghost. You may be seated. Angels' curiosity. But what about the other world? Demons. What would it be like to be a demon? Some of you boys don't have to think very hard. What goes through the mind of a devil? He's always trying to take advantage of us, as it says in 2 Corinthians 2.11. We ought not to be ignorant concerning his devices and methods. We need to know how the enemy is operating. 2 Corinthians 11.14. We don't want him... To get an advantage over us because he has the ability to transform himself as an angel of light. 
you know, angels, when you start talking about angels and demons, like weird people show up. And just a quick commercial, as we're talking about angels and demons, please don't tell me your angel and demon stories after service. Brother Caleb Herring wants to hear everyone's angel and demon story after service. And I will give you his personal cell phone if you could put that on the screen right now. No, I'm just kidding. But demons. So we got to be careful when we follow and get so wrapped up in the angelic world. We don't worship angels. We don't pray to angels. And Paul said it like this in Galatians 1, 8, and 9. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which was preached unto you. Let him be a curse. No matter how spiritual you think you are and how spiritual you get. And no matter how many angels you see and visitations you have. If it is contrary to the word of God, it is not of God. It can preach good, it can sound good, but if it's not word-based, it doesn't matter. And so, what would go through a devil's mind? The Bible says in the book of John 8, 44, that the devil is a liar and that he is the father of it. There is no truth in this adversary that we are up against. The Bible says in John 10, 10, the devil is a thief. He's come to steal, to kill and to destroy. That is what he is about, as it says in Peter 5 8. Our adversary, he is as a roaring lion going, roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. The devil's not your homeboy. He's not your BFF. He's not there to take care of you. He will st- see the devil. This may sound wrong, but the devil's not racist. He's not prejudiced. He's not sexist. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what background you come from, whether you're male or female. He treats us all the same. He wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So what goes through a devil's mind? I bring our attention to Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 19. There's a revival that pours out in the city of Samaria, and it is pretty remarkable. Philip comes to Samaria, and there is a mighty demonstration of the hand of God. There's miracles, signs, and wonder. In Acts 8, 8, it says that there was great joy in that city. It says they received the word of God. It says that people were healed. Demons were cast out of people. It was amazing. And it says in verse 9, there was a man there named Simon who used sorcery and he bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Everyone listened to him in verse 10. From the least to the greatest said, this guy is the power of God. They had regard of him. He bewitched them with sorceries for a long time. But verse 12, Philip comes and he preaches the things concerning the kingdom of God, heaven, the name of Jesus Christ. People are baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believes also. He gets baptized and he follows Philip and he's wondering. He's amazing and beholding these miracles and signs that are done. Simon the Soros did it in deception and darkness. But Philip's doing it in light and truth. And so he's just like, wow, this is a different approach. So he's watching him and observing all the miracle signs and wonder. And you would say, especially in modern day American religion and Christianity, a church that has joy, baptism, it has miracles, signs, wonder, people believe in Jesus, people read the word of God, we would say that's a spirit-filled, born-again church. That's the conclusion most would draw. Well, look what the scripture says. The scripture says they send to him in verse 14, Peter and John. Why did they send Peter and John? Verse 15, because Peter and John had to pray for these people so they could receive the Holy Ghost. Receive the Holy Ghost. Demons were cast out. Miracle signs and wonder. Acts 8, 8 says there's great joy in the city. See, some people say, well, I I know I got the spirit because I got joy. Acts 8, 8, they had joy. They had miracles and deliverance. They had water baptism. Some people say when you get baptized, that's when you receive the Spirit. But the Bible, 
Acts 8 is one remarkable chapter to help us to understand something. That your belief experience and your spirit baptism experience are two separate experiences. So they pray that they receive the Holy Ghost because in verse 16 it says, none of them had received the Holy Ghost. They were only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they laid their hands on these people and they received the Holy Ghost. And Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given and he offered them money. What did Simon see? That he would pull out his wallet and say, I want that power. Do we really believe Though it does not specifically mention tongues. Neither does Joel 2.28, but that's what Peter used on the book of Acts chapter 2 to explain what the outpouring of speaking in tongues was. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Do we believe that Simon the sorcerer saw the apostles lay hands upon these people and they're like, ah. He goes, man, I want that power. What did he see? This demonic witchcraft sorcery man. See, the enemy, he is not our friend. He wants to destroy the kingdom of God. He looks at you. He looks at the church. He looks at the things of God. And all that grows through his mind is steal, kill, destroy. Steal, kill, destroy. That's all the enemy wants to do. But this man that's been full of the devil saw somebody receive the Holy Ghost and he offered money that day. He saw something he never... Let me just say this real fast. If you're here today and you have never received the Holy Ghost, you have never spoken in other tongues, and you're here and you are not accustomed to this culture, this setting of Pentecost, you might come from a non-church background or a different church background, whether it be Baptist, whether it be Methodist, whether it be Catholic, whether it be Lutheran, we're not here mocking you, we're not here to insult you, we're not here to slam down and condemn you, we're not here to make you feel inferior or uncomfortable, but listen, hold on. Before you get mad, saying, oh, how dare you? How dare you say, I don't have the Spirit of God because I haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost. I, God's changed me. God, I felt his presence. I cried. I, I prayed and God healed my grandmother of cancer. I prayed and God set me free from pornography. I believe everything you're saying. Because we just read in Acts chapter 8 where people prayed sincerely and God healed them and God delivered them and God set them free and God even get, gave them great joy in that city. See, it's kind of like this, this bottle of water. Like, if you think of the Holy Ghost like this, if I was to pour this on my face, I feel that. Now I'm filled with it. Two different things. Look, you can't come to God except the Spirit draw you. And if you think it felt good when God delivers you, what do you think it's going to feel like when the Spirit... <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like a well springing up from your belly. It's joy, unspeakable, and full. We're walking on this earth. It's a dry, it's a barren land. And yes, it's hot. Yes, we're going to pass out. And water will make you feel good. But the only way to make it through this desert is to get the life source inside.
Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I'm telling you, God is about to pour out the Holy Ghost in a fashion beyond feeling his presence, but being filled with his presence. Can you lift your hands? Can you lift your voices? Hallelujah! Angels, demons, curiosity. We know what's on the mind of a devil. What could ever distract a devil from steal, kill, destroy? Things of darkness on that enemy's mind. Things that are not of God. Steal, kill, Diet Coke, artificial sweetener. Things that are not of God. You know. I just lost every preacher in the house because it's like the official beverage of Pentecost, Diet Coke. But the things that go through the enemy's mind, what can ever distract him? What can ever get his curiosity? And we read about a man that has been entertained by devils and been possessed by devils and used by the devil. Steal, kill, destroy. Steal, kill. What's this Holy Ghost? And Simon the sorcerer on that day saw something He's never seen before. A child of God filled with the Holy Ghost. And the same devil then is the same devil now. He'll hang out in a city. And everything will be at peace. Until someone's filled with the Holy Ghost. And he pulls out that pocketbook. And he says, I'll buy that from you. I'll give you this money if you give me that power. Because the devil knows the power of the Holy Ghost. There is a battle in this last day to get people to sell out when it comes to the Holy Ghost. We have become a church that has greater comfort and fitting in than we've ever had before. We know how to blend in with other denominations. We know how to blend in in the rest of the church scope. In fact, they are coveting and desiring some of the things that we have and that we enjoy while we're coveting and desiring the things that they have and they enjoy. It's so interesting dichotomy that we are finding ourselves in right now. And there is this pressure upon us to be more user-friendly kind of church. How can we increase the traffic into this building without scaring them and driving them off? And so there is this temptation to reduce the amount of speaking in tongues demonstration to suppress the spirit and tell people to be a little more professional in the pulpit and to carry themselves a little more proper and just be a little more pristine and be a little more professional. There is this tremendous, anyone ever bring someone to church before? You know, you know, the pastor, come on, bring someone to church, bring someone to church, bring someone to church. You're like, yeah, but you guys are weird. And you're fitting in in the school. And finally, you work up the courage to bring a friend to church, and you, you come to church, and you set them down, and you're just like, oh, God, please, 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 not a weird service. Please, not a weird service. Please, nothing creepy. I, I pray Sister Shanae is not here tonight because she's crazy. She is flat out crazy. And you look around, and Sister Shanae didn't come. You're like, oh, thank God. We're going to have a chill service. And then they open up the song with amazing grace. And all of a sudden, Sister Shanae comes in. You're like, oh, she's here. But she can't dance to this song. This is too slow of a song. We're okay. Amazing grace. 
But what we don't know is that was a song that she heard when she first got in the church. And all of a sudden she... And we feel all embarrassed, intimidated, and scared. But listen, the reason why anyone would walk through the doors of your church is they're looking for something they have yet to find. And you have found the well of salvation. You have found the gift of the Holy Ghost. You have found that great treasure. And that devil is tempting youth groups to change their structure and change the way they function and change the way they operate and say, look, if you would just scale back on that, that devil is saying, look, you'll get more money. You'll get more offering. You'll get more tithe paying. You'll get more visitors. You'll get more people in the room. And all the time you're exchanging currency for the Holy Ghost. And yeah, there might be more people in the room. And yeah, you might have a nice new remodel. And you might have pretty motion graphics. And you might have new new toys on your guitar and you might have new machines spitting out fog you know why other churches went to all of that stuff is because they were trying to supplement what they do not have and what they do not have is an authentic powerful real genuine move of the holy ghost i am not attacking any church in this room that has these things, I think we should strive to be the best we can and have a spirit of excellence and give the most proper presentation that we know to give because it reflects how we feel about the church. I want the church to be great. I want it to be beautiful. I want it to look good. But may we remember, it's not the smoke machine. It's not the lights. It's not the guitar solo. It's not the singers. It's the Holy Ghost. That ain't going to set someone free from crack. That going to set someone free that's struggling with pornography. Look, I thank God for talent and music. And musicians, however many hours you put into your instrument, I hope you got some hours in prayer. I hope you got some hours in speaking in tongues, interceding for the worship set you're about to be part of. It's not about your professionalism and your skill set and your ability. It's the Holy Ghost working through your hands. Hallelujah! Someone shout the Holy Ghost! Uh, we don't need more recreation in our youth groups. You guys play all the time. You goof off all the time. You're watching all the time. Listen, you do not need movie nights. You don't need more entertainment nights. You don't need more hanging out. You need more Holy Ghost. We need more Holy Ghost. We need more Holy We need it. Can you lift your hands? Can you lift your voice? Come on, someone with the Holy Ghost. Can you pray in the Spirit? Hey! Samare ororo malareya! Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost! I thank God. I thank God for all of this. In our church in Watertown, South Dakota, 
We're constantly trying to improve. We're constantly monitoring, looking at everything. We want to have a great atmosphere. We've never had a guitar player. I love songs with that guitar. I love the sound of a guitar. But you go to our church, we don't have the best this. We don't have the best that. But we do have the Holy Ghost. And just a couple months ago, in the worship set that you may have laughed off and thought was not very good, a man lifted up his hands with a disease, with warts and cracks and blood all over his hands there anytime he would close he'd have to bandage and put a bandage on there and paint all these kinds of things in his hands but when he lifted up his hands and began to worship there was an anointed drummer that prays an hour a day there was an anointed piano player that prays an hour a day there was anointed singers that sing and anoint and pray an hour a day and them as they sang under the power of the Holy Ghost that man lifted up his hands and God healed him instantly Instantaneously, I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost can do more. My mom, who was addicted to cocaine, was in a gang, went to prison for attempted manslaughter. She was one bad mama jamma. You wouldn't want to mess with her. This Mexican mama from Tijuana, she cut you. You don't mess with her. She was bad. She was tough. Struck fear in people. But on the verge of her marriage being broken and her life falling to pieces, she was invited to a rinky, dinky, stinky little Pentecostal church that couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. And she sat there without any professional nothing. And she was trembling under the presence of God. And some ignorant preacher that wasn't eloquent pulled out a chair and said, you step out from where you're at and God will forever change the course of your family history I thank God that there was a church that had the Holy Ghost I speak to every home missions work in this house right now I speak to every church planner in this house right now hear me I love you I honor you and I know the pressure that you feel and that you face because there is a pressure upon us to try to present some sort of numbers of effect within a certain amount of time frame I've been at it for 15 years and it seems as if I have been failure after failure after failure you look at your bank account and you look at your presentation and it feels like you got nothing much to show for it but if you got the Holy Ghost you have everything you have everything Someone shout the Holy Ghost. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by His Spirit. It's by His Spirit. It's by His Spirit. Now, so serious is the Holy Ghost that Jesus said it's the only sin that cannot be forgiven. For you see, you can mock the work of his flesh, but don't mock the work of his spirit. And now me personally, I'm not, you do whatever you want. My personally, I don't like when people mimic tongues. I don't like it at all. It scares me. It makes me, I'm not saying you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Man, but it's too sacred of a thing to make a joke out of to get laughs out of people, in my opinion. I just, I just don't go there. My personal opinion, if you've done it, hold on. If you've done it, I'm not trying to make it feel like a jerk. But just maybe reconsider what you're doing. Just that, that's all. Just think about what you're doing. The most sacred thing, the most powerful force. And here's what's interesting to me. You guys okay? You okay? Can I talk a little bit? I'll, I'll, I'll hurry up. The most two powerful forces outside of this world. Heaven above hell beneath, and us in between. The angels looking at this Holy Ghost. These demons looking at this Holy Ghost. Heaven above, hell beneath, 
fixing their eyes on this one moment here in Mississippi. And we sit in church. Something's wrong. Something is eerily wrong. When these two powerful forces are locked in in this moment and we're checked out, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, you just sit chill in your pew in your chair, and you're sitting there criticizing the musicians, criticizing the sermon, yawning, dunk, you just don't enjoy yourself. You're saying, well, I wish we would have this. I wish we would. You're missing a powerful moment called the Holy Ghost. God, wake us up to the power. Wake us up to the sacredness. Wake us up to the realization and revelation of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Someone shout the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Uh, the most powerful, awesome force this side of eternity. The irony, the conundrum. Because the Bible gives us this interesting insight in 1 Corinthians 14 32. That the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Meaning, you could be shouting in tongues, speaking in tongues, running around, jumping. And the preacher says, I'd like you to return to your seat. You know what that means? You have the ability to reel it in, cooperate with the man of God, and go back to your seat. Don't get so spiritual. Where you try to speak in tongues louder than the direction trying to be given from the ministry. I was like, like, I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable, like at a camp or a convention, and you got like a huddle of people speaking in tongues. The preacher comes up, and they're so loud, and everybody's like, "Oh, I wish someone would tell them to shut up." I wish someone. You know, the Bible says you can. That might hurt your feelings, but that's the Bible. We're just using the Bible. That's all, folks. Don't get, don't get too serious. Because we are a body that works in harmony and together. And so if anyone ever gives you instructions, say, hey, shh. Shh. And don't get all bent out of shape and mad about it. Because that spirit is not the Holy Spirit. Because it says things are done in decency... And in order. But it is amazing to me that the most powerful force can be reeled in. What does the scripture say? It says, quench not the spirit in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. You know why it says quench not the spirit? Because you have the ability to quench the spirit. You ever leave a church service? And then you get in the car and you're friends and it's just kind of quiet. And you, you lean over and say, man, is it me or did it feel like something more was about to happen in church service? You ever think that? You know why you're thinking that? Is because more than likely something more was supposed to happen in that service. But why did it not happen? We quenched the Spirit.